All right. Uh, welcome back for everyone in person and everyone online. Welcome back to our uh, annual symposium. This is going to be our third panel of the day. Uh, let me just share that screen real quick. So this is our panel on, well, it's not being shared, but this panel is about the secret code, balancing defendants' rights or proprietary interests in forensic analysis, and I'll let our panelists take it away. Well, welcome, and I'm really excited to be here and have the opportunity to introduce our esteemed panel, starting first with Dr. Mark Perlin. Dr. Perlin is Chief Scientist and Executive of Cybergenetics, maker of the probabilistic genotyping software True Allele. He provides forensic DNA expert services for both the defense and prosecution. He holds doctoral degrees in mathematics from City University of New York computer science from Carnegie Mellon, and a medical degree from the University of Chicago. Next, we have Professor Rebecca Wexler. Professor Wexler is an assistant professor of law at the University of California Berkeley School of Law, and is also the faculty co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. Professor Wexler teaches, research, researches, excuse me, and writes on issues concerning data, technology, and criminal justice. Last but not least, we have Mr. Charles Graves. Mr. Graves is a partner at Wilson Sonsini, where he litigates trade secret disputes and provides intellectual property counseling on complex trade secret matters. Mr. Graves frequently writes and lectures on trade secret matters and his ideas and approaches have set new precedent in California and influenced practice nationwide. As your moderator, my name is Kelly Kulik. I've been a deputy public defender for Santa Clara County for 23 years. Um, Prior to my position as a research supervisor, I was on our homicide team for seven years with an emphasis on litigating complex forensic cases. Just to let you know, we will start today by each of our panelists giving some time for a brief statement on the issues, and then we will be turning to questions. We encourage everyone today to submit questions and would ask that you submit them through the Q&A, the question and answer, and not the chat, so we have a, a better chance to kind of to track everything. Um, let me just make a few comments starting. Um, forensic science was put on notice about 15 years ago that human, or what's referred to also as manual interpretation of complex DNA results was unreliable. The development of probabilistic genotyping software changed that, relying largely on statistical methods, mathematical algorithms, and probability distributions Probabilistic genotyping software enables interpretation of genetic material that is degraded, comes from multiple people, or is present at low concentrations. Um, I think when we talk about source code and probabilistic genotyping, it's just important to make sure we're talking apples to apples in terms of terms. Um, an algorithm describes a procedure. A computer programmer then translates the algorithm into source code using a computer programming language. And this source code is then compiled into executable software. I'm certainly no expert in probabilistic genotyping for uh, source code, but I do have firsthand knowledge of the importance of this emerging technology, not only as an aid in prosecution, but in defense and exoneration. In 2020, I was one of the defense lawyers representing a defendant accused of a sexual homicide where the government was seeking the death penalty. Uh, the case involved hundreds of pieces of evidence most with complex uh, DNA mixtures. The government's crime lab was still using human interpretation or that manual interpretation that I was talking about. And all of their result, results pointed to guilt only of our client. Probabilistic genotyping typing software uh, was introduced by the defense and it pointed to the profiles of five unknown contributors on, on numerous, um, pieces of evidence, um, including intimate swabs of the victim. The probabilistic genotyping software evidence supported an entirely different theory of the case, an exculpatory one, and the jury returned a verdict of not guilty on all counts in the death penalty case. So while I'm gonna leave it to the experts on the source code and the balancing of those rights um, with access to it, what I do know is that this is a really important piece of technology for everybody involved um, in the criminal justice system. So what I'd like to start with is uh, turning um, the mic over to Dr. Perlin 
for some of his remarks on this issue. Um, thank you. Uh, should I share my slides or um, are you going to show them? My understanding is that if you could show your slides and work through them, that would be very helpful. All right, let me do that then. Thank you. Okay, does that work? Yes, we can see it. Great, uh, let me start then, thank you. So today I'll be talking about innovation and transparency for reliable forensic software. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to focus on a case that involved source code requests, California versus Martel Chubbs. In 1977, a 17-year-old Long Beach mother was found raped and murdered in her home. Her toddler uh, girl was at her feet. Uh, years later, in, on a cold case project in 2011, a DNA lab tested the vaginal swabs and found a three-person mixture, victim elimination and unknown. And the next year, the major sperm fraction profile was found to match Martel Chubbs with uh, a manual method statistic, combined probability of inclusion or CPI of one in 10,000. And uh, the next year, uh, our company, Cybergenetics, using our truly probabilistic genotyping technology, found a likelihood ratio statistic to Chubbs of um, over a quintillion. That's a one followed by 18 zeros. Uh, the lawyers for Chubbs approached the DNA uh, in an interesting way. It was hard to attack the reliability. Uh, the software was extensively validated uh, as probabilistic genotyping software. We'd already had a Kelly Fry hearing in California. And so the question tactically is how do you suppress incriminatory, uh, incriminatory DNA evidence? And the approach that was taken is to, uh, from my perspective, to demand irrelevant trade secrets that a company can't release. And that's the source code gambit. Hire an expert, falsely claim that source codes needed to assess software reliability. What's source code? Uh, well, we begin with an algorithm looking on the left here. It's a procedure for solving a problem. And a programmer uh, writes computer instructions called source code in a human readable computer language that on the last step, a computer compiler can translate into a software application. That's what users have, that's what's tested. Input goes in, output comes out, and that's what's in the real world. Algorithms can be patented, uh, they're published, we publish our algorithms. Uh, patents have not been great for protecting algorithms recently, given the Alice decision from about 10 years ago. Uh, and so that leaves trade secrets, which is not disclosing uh, proprietary information. And that's generally source code for commercial software is a trade secret. But the software application is released and that's what can be tested and assessed. How do scientists assess scientific reliability? Science almost by its definition for the last 350 years is the empirical testing of hypotheses. That's what science means and that's what makes science different from other fields like law or politics or religion. Uh, there are national standards and guidelines uh, for testing probabilistic genotyping software called PGS sometimes. And the computer source code is entirely irrelevant to this scientific testing to national standards or admissibility standards. You basically, you take your software, you put data into it, and then you run it and you see what comes out. That is true for the software, the robots, any machines, the chemistries, that's how science works. And Cybergenetics makes the software available as an application program for free uh, for testing by defense experts. We make many other things available as well, but by making the application available, that's the height of transparency. Uh, there've been at least 42 written up validation studies where true allele has been tested. Eight of them have been published in peer reviewed journals, which is the scientific and Daubert standard for uh, having the community give an anonymous assessment, an independent assessment of the reliability of a technology. Another way of testing software is to run other programs that are similar, other PGS programs or methods 
on the same Chubbs data in the case. And that was done. Nine programs, whether it's the simple CPI methods or uh, the open source methods uh, that where anybody can look at the source code and see what's going on, LRMix, Lab Retriever, like LTD, all of these programs pretty much they gave the same answer. Chubbs was included. With simple software that made less use of the data, the answer might only have been in the thousands or billions. With more sophisticated software that could fully engage the quantitative data, the answers were in the quadrillions or quintillions, uh, 16 or 18 zeros. Uh, True Allele has a broad community that relies on the results. For post-conviction, we've helped 10 exonerations of innocent men. Uh, there have been almost 250 defense cases we've worked on, including acquittals that uh, were directly attributable to the use of better forensic science of true allele. Our crime labs have uh, solved tens of thousands of criminal cases. We worked on the World Trade Center disaster, uh, helping to identify 18,000 victim remains. And scientists who study DNA publish papers where they use true allele as a way of objectively and accurately measuring DNA information uh, from samples and mixtures. And there are other applications as well. The Chubbs appellate decision um, had three main points uh, addressing uh, what the defense ha had appealed on. First is the trade secret privilege. I had said, uh, the court said that the defense requires a prima facie particularized showing that the source code is relevant and necessary. Uh, that didn't happen. They opined on the necessity of source code in their unpublished opinion. Uh, they said Chubbs has not demonstrated how Trulial source code is necessary to his ability to test the reliability of its results. And they addressed the confrontation cause as uh, being premature in the case. And in 2016, Chubbs pleaded no, uh, no contest to the homicide charges and uh, was sentenced to seven years and eight months in prison. Uh, over 20 courts have ruled on source code. And on the left, I'm showing you cases where there was a hearing with expert testimony. On the right, where there was no hearing or expert testimony, it was just done on the papers. Uh, this started in 2009 uh, with the Foley case. It's continued today. In fact, a few months ago at the bottom, the left column is Pennsylvania versus Spudis. In blue, those are the cases where the courts have ruled that the defense is not entitled to source code, mainly because they can test the program scientifically on data like real scientists do. Uh, there was an interesting result uh, that we may be talking about more today that was very aberrant. There was no hearing, expert testimony. The facts were completely incorrect. And that was New Jersey versus Cor Corey Pickett. Uh, it's another case I'm involved in where the judge uh, just adopted the picket uh, decision without um, much further ado. I do wanna stress that under suitable protective orders, cybergenetics has indeed provided its true allele source code to defendants. We don't think it's useful uh, for anything, but if asked and it's important for the case to continue, we will. Now the source code gambit basically feeds on false facts. In California versus Chubbs, the expert wrote, access to this code is the only way to fully consider the validity of the software. The court did not agree. In New Jersey versus Pickett, uh, the court said many things that were strange, including that source code access would allow an expert to independently test uh, whether the software works as intended. Uh, I do, as a, one of my PhDs is in computer science, and that's not a true statement. It's I don't know where it comes from. You test application software. You don't test source code. It's not going to answer that question. And these myths are picked up by academics and propagated. There's a law professor who wrote a Harvard Data Science Review article where in his one sentence that mentioned true allele, there were three statements that were incorrect. It's not the case that uh, true allele and star mix were excluded. Uh, by the court, only Starmix was. Trulial wasn't even in evidence. The FBI did not develop Starmix. And in fact, I've, as I've written uh, and published on this, a Starmix reached two contradictory results itself. Trulial uh, 
agreed with one result and disagreed with the other. So these statements don't make much sense. But that's what courts end up picking up on, these urban myths and false facts. The way the gambit actually works is escalating demands. First, they ask if they can read the source, source code. The judge orders it, we give it to them. They're not happy. Then they get electronic source code. They ask for more. Of course, we're concerned, what if they lose it on the internet? Um, then they ask to run it. And then they ask to build it. The most recent uh, requests that have been denied by courts is they want to rebuild the entire software system themselves, redoing a a 10 or 20 year development effort. Nowhere do they mention testing the software application, which is how real scientists assess reliability. Uh, so the goals are mainly to suppress scientific evidence in a case and more largely as a national effort to eliminate forensic science innovation. But the impact would be to block scientific truth, which in my view leads to injustice. I have a lot of experience seeing that. And there's another goal that I sense in many of the amicus briefs, which is to eliminate trade secret protection for all software. In light of the minimal patent protection uh, after the Alice decision, I would say trade secrets is what we have left and the impact on reducing Silicon Valley and America's competitiveness in the software engineering, uh, software industry uh, is not good for the country. So in conclusion, science and law uh, has reliability based on empirical testing. Source code doesn't provide empirical testing. Uh, these uh, discovery demands are irrelevant to reliability. They're destructive to innovation. And real transparency requires software testing access, which is given by private companies. And trade secrets are not material and can ruin companies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Perlin. If we could now turn to Professor Wexler, and if I could invite you to join us with your remarks, please. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. All right. Um, so thank you for having me here. I'm delighted and honored to be here. And today I'm gonna argue that trade secrets should not be privileged in criminal cases. The party seeking access to the trade secret information, whether it's the prosecution or defense, should be entitled to obtain it using the normal subpoena standards that apply to all kinds of sensitive information commonly at issue in criminal cases, like alleged victims' medical records, banking records, intimate communications between parents and children, trade secrets should not be given more protection than that other information. Before I get to the nuts and bolts of this argument, I'm gonna zoom way out. Um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna give some broad but crucial background on truth seeking in the criminal legal system that's often left out of these conversations about source code versus black box access. Trust me, it will come back and be relevant to the trade secret argument. So to start, the criminal legal system seeks truth through adversarialism. This means that the law enforcement, prosecution and police are tasked with investigating evidence of guilt. The defense is tasked with investigating evidence of innocence and with testing the government's case to find flaws and weaknesses. This is a bifurcated investigative process. Law enforcement has zero constitutional, statutory, or ethical duty to affirmatively seek out evidence of innocence. That duty belongs to defense counsel alone. So with forensic science, how does this play out? As Dr. Perlin mentioned, there is a reliability standard for admissibility of scientific and expert testimony. It is a minimal threshold of reliability that the prosecution, if they're the ones introducing the evidence or defense, if they're the ones introducing the evidence has to satisfy under Daubert or Fry. It's more than no 
requirement of reliability, which is generally what applies to most types of evidence. It merely has to be relevant to be presumptively admissible. So the prosecution bears this burden in most cases if they're introducing forensic evidence of guilt to satisfy minimal reliability showing. And they can satisfy that showing with whatever kind of information they want. It's their burden. They can tell their own story. That's part of the adversary system's truth seeking process. Each party gets to pick the information that it wants to use to develop its case. So the prosecution can use black box testing to satisfy the reliability standard for admissibility. And if they persuade the judge that they've met the Daubert or Fry basis, they're a-okay, they're good. At the same time, the defense has a duty to do an independent investigation. And their duty is to find any information that they can that will aid in cross-examination of the forensic evidence. They cross-examine this evidence in the admissibility hearing and again at trial, because even if the evidence satisfies this minimal threshold of reliability to be admissible, the Supreme Court's emphasized, even in Daubert itself, vigorous cross-examination, the presentation of contrary evidence, and careful instruction on the burden of proof are traditional and appropriate means of attacking shaky but admissible evidence. So the defense has a duty to investigate any possible flaws or weaknesses in the government's evidence. And just like the prosecution can satisfy its reliability burden with whatever information it wants, the defense gets to choose their strategy for trying to identify flaws or weaknesses in the government's case to a point. And now let's get into what the defense is entitled to do. The main investigative power that the defense can use in um, undertaking this duty to develop evidence for cross-examination is a subpoena. Now the normal baseline standard to subpoena sensitive information in criminal cases, again, like an alleged victim's medical records, bank records, or intimate conversations with their parents or their child is the normal subpoena standard. That has three main limits. The information has to be relevant. So information that's irrelevant is already inaccessible to the defense under the normal non-privileged standards. I wanna emphasize that information that's irrelevant should not be available to the defense. In addition, the defense has to show that the information they seek is admissible at trial, and they have to identify it with specificity, even though they haven't yet seen it. This is a hard burden to bear. It's a higher burden than applies in civil cases, where civil litigants can obtain information via subpoena or discovery merely by showing that information is likely to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. The defense has to show the information is actually going to be admissible. So narrow subpoena standard. Um, okay. That said, the relevance standard is actually quite lenient. It doesn't mean nothing. Irrelevant evidence, not available. Relevant evidence, though, presumptively available, presumptively admissible. And by relevance, the law says it's information that has any tendency to make a fact of consequence more or less likely than it would be without the evidence. The reason it's a liberal standard is because the rules of evidence are liberal as part of the legal system's truth-seeking process. The Supreme Court's even said that information that helps a party tell a coherent narrative to the jury is sufficiently relevant to be admissible. All right. Um, so the defense, the takeaways here, the defense investigation is essential to the adversarial truth-seeking process. It has a baseline subpoena standard built in that already balances the liberal thrust of the judicial system to try to get all relevant evidence to serve the truth-seeking process against concerns about overbroad subpoenas or harassing subpoenas by limiting the defense access to information that's relevant, admissible, and identified with specificity. There are a small number 
of exceptions to this baseline standard. And we call these evidentiary privileges. You've heard of these with the attorney-client privilege, spousal communications, priest-penitent privilege, national security secrets. The Supreme Court has emphasized time and again that privileges should be construed narrowly because they are in derogation of the search for truth. What privileges do is suppress relevant evidence from the truth-seeking process of the courts. If it's irrelevant, it's not coming in anyway. If it's relevant, it's presumptively admissible, presumptively accessible, unless it's privileged, in which case the privilege holder can suppress the relevant evidence from the jury, the judge, and the opposing party. Now, the way privileges work is they raise the burden on the party seeking access to information so that instead of having to prove relevance, admissibility and specificity, now they also have to prove necessity. So get this, you've got to prove that information is necessary to your case that you haven't yet seen. It's a catch-22. There's going to be some unknown number of cases where information could be outcome determinative, have changed the result of a criminal case, either from conviction to acquittal or vice versa, if the information had come to light. But because a privilege imposes a heightened burden, that information may never come to light. And this is why privileges overall are acknowledged to be anti-truth. They are justified by other societal policy goals that are extrinsic to the truth-seeking process, like marital harmony, national security. And because those other policy goals are so important to us, we are willing to sacrifice on truth to serve them. Now, I promised you I'd get back to the trade secrets privilege. So let me pose the question for you today which I think is the central question on this debate. When a private company's trade secrets are relevant evidence in a criminal case, should the law grant them more protection against disclosure than we give to the intimate conversations between parents and children? Should we permit companies to suppress relevant evidence from the truth seeking process even when we compel parents to testify against their children and children to testify against their parents? Or should we tell trade secret holders that the normal baseline subpoena standards that balance access versus secrecy that already apply to most sensitive information in criminal cases are also gonna apply to them? that they have to hand over relevant and admissible evidence if identified with specificity. And then courts will do what is in their full discretion to do to protect the trade secret owner's financial interests to the full extent reasonable by using protective orders, sealing orders, and closing courtrooms. I think the answer is the latter. I'm gonna give you three quick reasons we can discuss in Q&A a little bit more. The first is privileging trade secrets specifically in criminal cases is harmful and unnecessary. In civil cases, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about this in a moment, but trade secret litigation often takes place between well-resourced adversaries who are business competitors. So if you raise a trade secret privilege in a civil case, you can bet that the adversary is gonna challenge whether you have a valid trade secret. In a criminal case, you're likely to assert a trade secret against defense counsel who does not know up from down on challenging the basis of your intellectual property right. And so the risk of fraudulent overclaiming or pretextual overclaiming of the privilege is greater in criminal cases. In addition, when we privilege trade secrets in a criminal case, it's harmful because it appears to project the message that the government values intellectual property as much or more than life and liberty. And adding insult to injury, those harms are unnecessary because criminal defense discovery is already so narrow that's exceedingly unlikely defendants will get access to irrelevant trade secret information. And if they do get an order 
compelling disclosure, the court can limit that disclosure with sealing orders, protective orders requiring experts to sign non-competes. My second argument is that privileging trade secrets in criminal cases actually overprotects intellectual property from the perspective of substantive trade secret law. Trade secret law doesn't give you full property rights against the world. It gives you rights against misappropriators, people who acquire your trade secret, use or disclose it with improper means. But cross-examination and defense advocacy is not theft. It's not improper means of acquiring trade secret information. Um, so if you give your trade secret to a defense expert witness or defense attorney, and that person turns around and steals it, builds a competing company, publishes it on the internet, you can sue. That would be misappropriation. You still have the full ex post remedies that the substantive trade secret law affords. Allowing you to withhold the information in the first place necessarily gives protection plus. Now you might say, wait, wait a second. This isn't just about ex post remedies. Trade secret law also gives you injunctions. Maybe this is kind of like an injunction. But in order to get an injunction in trade secret law, you have to show actual or threatened misappropriation. You can't just speculate that somebody is gonna steal your stuff. And so in a criminal adversary context where defense counsel, an officer of the court signs a protective order has never before violated, such a court order would be subject to professional sanction if they did loss of license, potential criminal prosecution, and they say, I have no intent to build a competing company or misappropriate your trade secret. That shouldn't qualify under the substantive law to get in what's often called and looked down on, and I think not even allowed in California, an inevitable disclosure injunction. Okay, um, last point. Tra uh, trade secret privilege in criminal cases fails to serve the purpose of either the substantive trade secret law or of privilege law. Now, a lot of theorists have pointed out, um, um, Charles Graves is one of them, uh, that um, trade secret law actually helps incentivize disclosure. It's designed to help incentivize disclosure, limited disclosure in important circumstances because Think about it. If you never tell anybody your secret, you don't need the law to protect you. It's a secret. Where you need trade secret law is when you want to disclose important information in a limited context, such as to a business negotiator, partner, or to a regulatory overseer, and you want to limit it from going on beyond that. So criminal defense advocacy should also be an important circumstance for controlled limited disclosure. Um, providing more protection in privilege law than we do in the substantive trade secret law goes against the purposes of privilege law because privilege law is supposed to balance extrinsic policy goals with the truth seeking interests of the court. Why would we give more protection here than the extrinsic substantive law gives outside? Okay, very last thing, because I want to bring it back to California. Here we are at Santa Clara University uh, School of Law. And I want to say, here's a um, article from the Santa Clara Prosecutor's Office, 1991, about the California statutory trade secret privilege. Now, California has a statutory trade secret privilege passed in the 60s uh, that, in my view, was always intended to apply in civil cases, not in criminal. And in the 1990s, the legislature enacted a separate set of provisions specifically to protect trade secrets in criminal cases. And they were drafted by this person, Kenneth Rosenblatt from the Santa Clara Prosecutor's Office. He wrote this article about them. What's important is that the criminal provisions provide for sealing orders, protective orders, closing of the courtroom. Because Mr. Rosenblatt was worried that trade secrets that are relevant evidence in a criminal case might be destroyed by being published to the public in public trials because of defendant's Sixth Amendment right to public trials and the public's First Amendment right to access courts. And they created these sealing protective order and closure protections to prevent that from happening. They don't anywhere say 
that trade secret law or the trade secret privilege should entitle companies to entirely withhold relevant evidence from criminal defendants. And I think they were right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wexler. I've had the privilege of actually meeting in person, Mr. Graves, and I'm gonna turn it over to you now for your remarks. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks, Mark and Rebecca as well. My background is almost exclusively in defending civil trade secret cases where someone is accused of misappropriation. Many of those cases center on source code. And I've had a strong interest in questions of defense access to alleged trade secrets for more than 20 years. I wrote perhaps the first article on this topic on the civil side of things back in 2003. Daniel, if we could have, if we could have the next slide. A few years later, I wrote about this topic for the well-known Cooley Trade Secret Treatise, and it helped with a California State Bar model protective order for civil trade secret cases to balance access concerns. My goal today is to describe the progress that courts and litigants have made in resolving competing interests when source code is at the heart of civil trade secret cases. Some of those lessons are distinct and would not apply to criminal cases, but many of them offer good analogies. I'm gonna be relentlessly practical today rather than speaking about public policy. Let's start by reminding ourselves of the competing concerns at stake on the civil side of things when a trade secret claim is made in source code. From a civil trade secret plaintiff's perspective, if a trade secret claim is made in source code, the plaintiff will be concerned about having to produce it and share it with the defense. And that's not just a concern about what might slip out in a court hearing or in a brief. Worried about the lawyers who will receive it and how they will store the source code. And the plaintiff will be concerned about who gets to see it beyond lawyers. From a civil trade secret defendant's perspective, on the other hand, the concern is about hiding the ball and prejudicing the defendant by preventing a fair exploration of the evidence. If the plaintiff's source code is not really secret or is obsolete, or is simply not the same thing as what a defendant has programmed at a new job, that won't come out unless the defense has independent access to study that source code. When I first began working on these issues more than 20 years ago, and like so much else in trade secret law, there was very little out there. There were few scholarly or practitioner sources to draw upon. And in each lawsuit, we had to struggle in the dark with opposing counsel, where there was not much in the way of custom or tradition to rely upon. But these issues have gotten much more routine in the two decades since. And I think we can safely refer to normative procedures that are now widespread on the civil side for handling source code in trade secret cases. So next, let's highlight different types of access problems in civil trade secret cases. In a civil trade secret case, a plaintiff asserts trade secret claims, often in technical information such as source code, and accuses the defendant, who is often a former employee who's changed jobs, of misappropriating that information. Sometimes these cases are straightforward. If the defendant is simply accused, for example, of downloading files on the way out the door at the old job, the case centers on getting those files back, and most such cases are short-lived. But the more difficult cases come where a departing employee did not take anything, but rather used her programming skills at her new job to write new source code for a competing or otherwise similar product at a new job. The plaintiff claims that the code is too close to what she wrote at her old job or was exposed to. There's usually a battle to force the plaintiff to identify what specific source code it claims to be the trade secret at issue. But for our purposes today, let's assume that the plaintiff has made that specific identification. And the question then arises, how is the plaintiff's source code to be produced for the defense? Who gets to see it? And under what circumstances? One dispute that arises is who gets to see it? And that's almost a due process question. In my article 20 years ago, when these questions were in their infancy, I wrote, in trade secret cases, plaintiffs often deny the defendant access under a protective order to the precise information at issue and argue that if the defendant were to learn it, he or she might misappropriate. 
Without such access, defense counsel can describe the charges to the client in only general language. This prevents the accused individual from drawing upon his or her personal knowledge to provide evidence that the information is in the public domain and thus not secret or was independently derived. In other words, the person in the best position to refute the allegations is silent. In other words, one issue on the civil side is whether the accused defendant is permitted to see what he or she is accused of misappropriate because he or she is best positioned to give eyewitness testimony that can bring important defenses to life. Back then, I argued that because federal rule of evidence 615, California evidence code 777C and similar rules in other states, allow an accused defendant to be present during all stages of a civil trial. The defendant was eventually going to see the source code anyway, if the case didn't settle. And it would be prejudicial to allow the case to get all the way to trial before the accused person could finally see what he or she was accused of misappropriate. And some courts have followed that logic in the years since. Since then, we've made a lot of progress. On the question of access by the accused defendant, courts generally agree that restricted access to the claimed trade secrets is permissible. And parties usually work out terms such as access only in the presence of defense counsel with no files or documents or code allowed to be held by the individual. But in criminal cases that do not allege a violation of criminal trade secret statutes, such as the Defend Trade Secrets Act or California Penal Code 499C, this particular problem is not the simple one. Mm -hmm. Rather, in a criminal prosecution where the defense counsel seeks access to the source code used by the prosecution, the question is not whether the individual defendant can see it, because he or she won't have eyewitness information that's pertinent to any question at stake. That said, and despite that distinction, the core concern is the same, allowing the defense counsel to test the evidence on hand for potential defenses. As a result, the closer analogy to criminal trade secret cases involves access to source code in civil cases by software experts who work for the defense under an agreed upon protective order. It's approved by courts. An expert witness who is sometimes an academic, sometimes a professional, but never someone who works for a competing software company has their CV vetted. And unless there's an objection, the defense hires him or her to review the source code at issue and form opinions, including how it operates. But how does the expert witness get access to the source code to review it in a civil trade secret case? The first step is the protective order, effectively a court approved contract, which the judge also signs, where the parties set forth detailed ground rules for the sharing of confidential information. It explains who can see what and under what circumstances. But when it comes to source code in civil cases, extra security steps are quite often put into place. A common one is that the source code will be delivered to the defense counsel by a messenger on an encrypted drive so that a secure chain of custody is established. Another common agreement is that the source code can only be loaded on a computer that is denetworked from the internet and other systems, effectively a standalone device. That prevents security breaches. Another is that the denetwork device be kept in a locked or secured room with a log kept of who accesses that room. The expert witness usually comes to that secure room at the law firm, and he or she studies the code there and only there. And any expert report or testimony about that source code is done only under seal. And even during trial, the courtroom is closed and people have to step out of the courtroom for that particular testimony. To some degree, courts have begun to recognize the need for these types of special source code access and security agreements. For example, the Northern District of California, our local federal court, has a model protective order with terms for source code cases available on its website. If we could have the next slide. That's something that parties can use as a template. It's not limited to trade secret cases and theoretically could be used in any type of case where source code access is an issue. By contrast, if we look at the model protective order for criminal cases on the court's website, it is much more perfunctory, much narrower. It mainly focuses on personal information that needs to be protected. So if we could turn to the next slide. I want to conclude by making comparisons between what we've learned on the civil side of trade secret law 
that might be useful for criminal cases where parties are debating the degree to which source code should be shared with defense counsel and their experts. Number one, I think that criminal courts, parties to criminal cases, could adopt the types of robust protective orders that are now the norm in civil trade secret cases, where we often have deeply articulated terms for security and handling that reduce the software owner's concern over security breaches and who gets to see it. Number two, I think that in criminal cases, the parties can also learn from what, we, what has become normative in civil cases with encryption, de-networked devices, secure rooms, access logs, and other very practical down-to-earth steps that can reduce some of the worries that the software owners have but also allow the defense its fair access to that information. And in court, and as Rebecca alluded to, partial sealing is a way that courts balance First Amendment concerns with protection of trade secrets, where part of the trial is sealed and most of it isn't. And documents filed in court are redacted and not available to the public to the extent they speak about the details of source code. So in conclusion, we've come a very long way on the civil side of trade secret cases in the two decades that I've been doing this. I think we've learned a lot along the way that would be analogous to maybe reduce some of the tensions and debate that we see on the criminal side of things. Thank you. Thank you. Turning to some questions, what I think I will do is direct the questions to one of our experts, but any and all are free to comment as well. Um, Dr. Perlin, I'm going to start with you with how does better DNA analysis promote better criminal justice? I think it comes back to something um, that Becky said, which is truth. And we have uh, different views of truth. Scientists, doctors, software engineers, ma uh, many people view truth as, as ways of testing through empirical data, uh, basically testing. Uh, there's a the legal perspective, maybe, that truth is results from two sides arguing. Uh, but the, the concept of truth, I think, is really paramount here. And I think that's sort of at the heart of the conflict. I mean, I believe that Professor Weckler believes passionately in one view of truth. I also know that scientists and uh, technologists and people who create uh, technologies uh, believe in truth, but the truth that that's relevant is empirical testing. Uh, so to get at the truth, the question isn't really what do you argue about, about how much you can ask until somebody just leaves the case. The question is, what can you find in the data? That's the purpose of the software. That's the purpose of forensic technology. Uh, to what extent can you take standard statistical methods, put them onto computers, and get all the information that's present in evidence wherever the chips fall? It's uh, the, the better modern software is not adversarial. It's subjective. Uh, it will simply give you an answer to what extent someone's present or not present in evidence. So I don't know, I'm, I'm seeing a cultural conflict here uh, and that what's being asked for is so immaterial to the reliability of, of software. And my own experience were the reasonable measures uh, that were just described. Um, I have to, your name isn't on the screen. <laughs> I can't, um, uh, by Charles the previous, Graves. excuse me? Uh, Mr. Graves, Charles Graves. Yeah, by, by, by uh, Charles Graves. Yeah, those are all reasonable measures, even if it's totally irrelevant. But what happens in practice is not what you're describing. I've, I've been through um, civil procedures. The patent law does not protect our invention. We litigated and we were told that identifying uh, people in the DNA to identify suspects is an abstract idea. Uh, doesn't make much sense to the lawyers I work with or to me. Uh, so you don't really have protection. Uh, our, we believe our technology has been stolen, not by lawyers, but by experts, by scientists. Um, but to answer the question, the, fundamentally, the purpose of better scientific innovation 
is to find truth in evidence that can be used in justice. And the, and the purpose of trade secret law, as I understand it, and the privileges is to promote that innovation and the games that are played where the defense goes far beyond the Northern California uh, standard protective order and starts demanding the right to rebuild the system for over five years in their own basement. I mean, that's not normal law. That's basically obstructing the truth by getting people to quit. Dr. Wexler, uh, or Professor Wexler, um, Dr. Perlin mentioned the idea of innovation. And if courts order companies to disclose trade secrets to defense expert witnesses under a protective order, what are your thoughts on whether this would discourage innovation of high qual quality technology for the criminal legal system? Yeah, thank you for the question. And, and thanks to my co-panelists for their uh, expert and insights. This has already been super fascinating. Um, I think that this, this question of how to get good technology into the criminal legal system is really important. Uh, and the, um, I mean, I had a, a number of things I wanted to mention to Dr. Perlin, if I could, before I jump into that, which is just to say, uh, the debate about whether source code is helpful at all or not, um, I think is a perfectly appropriate debate to bring to the courts and that a judge should determine that based on the relevant standard. So the arguments Dr. Perlin has laid out that say source code is irrelevant if there's real consensus in the scientific community that there's nothing useful to be gained, it shouldn't be disclosed. And you know that's a proper challenge to any subpoena or discovery motion. This is, this is irrelevant. Um, and you could have a battle of the experts and the judge will decide. So just, just wanted to, to acknowledge that those are important arguments. My own perspective is that judges are capable of identifying abusive or protectual subpoenas uh, and of making that determination as they do for many other kinds of sensitive information all the time. So, okay, so uh, back to your question. I'm sorry to have that deter um, little um, detour. Um, yeah, I think the real, you know, real substantive concern, if I were gonna argue against my own position, I think one of the, the most challenging questions is this question of the risk of deterring innovation, because I agree with Dr. Perlin, we want good technology in the criminal legal system. And at this point, I, my answer is I don't believe that compelling disclosure under a reasonable protective order will deter innovation. I think it's a speculative position. Uh, in fact, I could see that disclosing, routinely requiring disclosure under the types of conditions that Mr. Graves has raised could assist with improving innovation because developers would know that their tools are gonna to be subject to robust adversarial scrutiny. Um, and this could incentivize them to do a better job. Uh, in addition, if there's no really good reason not to disclose the information and subject it to that scrutiny, um, then then the scrutiny is simply an uh, the, uh, sorry then the secrecy is simply an opportunity to to conceal flaws in the technology. And so, if everything's working the way it should, robust adversarial challenges should be a call to spur better innovation. Turning to Mr. Graves. Um, one of the things that Professor Wexler mentioned was that judges can make these decisions with regards to things like relevance. And also she had mentioned about defense attorneys being able to litigate these issues. Do you think that criminal defense attorneys such as public defenders are equipped like large law firms to handle the special requirements of source code access in the litigation that follows? Yeah, I think they are. I think it's easier than a lot of people think of it. When you use words like encryption and de-network computers, people might feel that that's not familiar, but the reality is that there's easily inexpensive commercially available tools for encryption that parties usually agree on in advance. A de-network computer is simply a computer not attached to other systems or to the internet. So uh, it doesn't take much in the way of sophisticated technology or high cost to do this. Rather, the way that it happens on the civil side 
is that the opposing parties get together and negotiate the terms for access until both are satisfied. And knowing what encryption tool will be used, knowing what type of computer the code will be uh, stored upon, uh, sometimes even allowing the other side to come in and look at the computer and make sure they're happy with the security. It doesn't take a lot of time or money. It's actually very easy to do. So I do think all of these ideas are transportable to the criminal side. Uh, and I think would reduce the temperature on some of these debates in the same way they have on the civil side where this type of access has now become routine and not terribly controversial like it was many years ago. I like, there was a, a series of questions that I think blend together some that I would like to pose to all three of you. Um, I'll start with you, Dr. Perlin, which there's been um, some talk about that source code access is really not about truth, but more of a ruse to suppress unfavorable evidence or to drag on litigation. And also the idea that if that's true and that if defense counsel or even prosecution is really trying to engage in more of a fishing expedition, um, than really, um, or trying to drag something out rather than to seek truth, how does that affect our analysis of these issues? And are judges really in a position to be able to understand this and decide it? Well, I think over 95% of the time, the judges see that it is a ruse and they deny source code access. I show that in the slide I mean, of there. That's what, that's what judges decide. Um, our experience. So two things first. Uh, at Cybergenetics, we work for any client. We don't choose clients. They choose us, prosecutors, defenders, innocents. And all we do is test data with software, our software, other software, and so on. It, there's been, I think, no case I've been involved in where uh, an opposing expert actually ran a computer program and did what a scientist does, which is to test software. So the whole concept of opining about reliability by reading source code is it, they're not functioning like scientists under the norms of science or the standards. When we give the source code under something like the Northern California uh, model protective order, all that leads to is more motions and more demands. It, nothing will make the other side happy. I, it's obvious uh, to me that they're not interested in truth. They're interested in arguing. Uh, and the, some of these cases go on for years. Uh, so I think that if, that if uh, scientific experts actually tested data on software, they would be able to answer questions pretty easily. Their side may not like the answer, but that would be helpful. But, but my experience about this ruse concept is that there is no point at which anybody is satisfied in the opposition. There's no agreement. Even in civil cases I've been involved in, there is easy agreement about terms for source code access. It was actually civil, <laughs> if you will. Uh, whereas in the criminal cases, there seems to be nothing anybody could ever agree on. And that's built into a strategy. Don't test, just argue, never agree, never surrender. I don't think that's what Charles is talking about. I think that's not uh, an appropriate way to handle these cases. Professor Wexler, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, so the first thing I wanna say is my understanding, Dr. Perlin is the scientist on the panel. My understanding is that there is a debate among scientists about when in what circumstances source code review can be useful. And I have colleagues in the computer science department here at Berkeley, uh, excellent computer science department, who say computer science source code is useful in certain circumstances. So my position is that if there is this scientific debate, the judge should be deciding this um, and the experts can debate it, but the proper legal standard that they should be fighting over is relevance not necessity. Necessity is the standard we apply when we have privileges that treat sensitive information more specially, more entitled 
to withhold or suppress relevant evidence from the courts when it's privileged. And that's why we have the necessity burden. So I just wanted to make sure to, to, to clarify that. Have a debate about whether it's useful, but apply the relevance standard, not the necessity standard for privileged information. Um, if the defense is using a ruse, as, as you said uh, um, in the question, uh, judges are up to the task. You know, this is a concern about defense advocacy in tons of circumstances. Same concern applies when you've got defense subpoenas for alleged victims sensitive information their communications, their banking records, whatever it is. Uh, this is a common problem that courts are, are well equipped to handle. Um, so it's up to the judge to decide when the subpoena has satisfied the legal standards and when it hasn't. Charles, your thoughts? You know, I think that the judges are the right people to make these decisions. On the civil side of things in trade secret cases, there are accusations going both ways about using discovery for delay or for the purposes. The defense accuses the plaintiff of that, the plaintiff accuses the defense of that. But at the end of the day, it's the judge who will set the scope and the parameters for appropriate discovery under the control of the standards. My view is that if judges have gotten more accustomed to the type of security procedures that are now routine in civil trade cases, they're exercising more control over that process than they used to because it feels familiar to them. And I suspect the same will happen over time on the criminal side as well, as judges get more used to these types of issues. And circling right back at you, Charles, um, just from a practical standpoint, um, because sometimes breaches happen, um, even under the best of circumstances. From your experience, I think you touched on it a little bit in your presentation. Is there ever litigation over a claimed breach? And if so, what do the civil courts do about it? So let's start with the proposition that a breach of a source code agreement is extraordinarily rare. I've actually never seen that in my career. Despite handling cases that involve the source code, like some of the biggest ones in Silicon Valley, and routinely sharing source code with these types of restrictions. So I don't want to give any kind of idea that this is normal or common or anything like that. To the extent there are litigation disputes over protective orders, they're usually on more minor issues like lines in a brief that were accidentally not filed under seal or off the list or uh, the expert was supposed to see this, but not that. Um, so I want to you know, emphasize that, at least in my experience over the years, source code agreements are robust. Experts' reputations are at stake. In other words, they're not going to get hired again as experts if they're cavalier with what they're doing. They're typically vetted carefully by both sides, uh, especially with people who might have any connection to a competing software company. And they're bound by a non-disclosure agreement Forever, meaning even when the case is over, the expert is still bound forever by that duty to protect what they see. And so I think there's a lot of institutional factors such as reputation and ongoing uh, restrictions that really reduce the chance uh, of any kind of breach or theft or that sort of thing, the types of security conditions that I'm talking about. And actually, I'm and Dr. Pernal, I'd like to hear your thoughts, but first to Professor Wexler, just to see. If we all have middle ground, is with regards to protective orders, are there any facets of those protective orders that you think are not fair to criminal defendants, either from a practical or a constitu constitutional standpoint? Or can we all come to a place with the right protective order that our scientists and defendants both have their interests protected? protected? Yeah, so I will say I, I hope that we can come to a place where everybody has their their interests protected to the full extent reasonable and I and I believe that I'm not an expert in the ins and outs of protective orders so I don't want to speak um, where I haven't uh, really had time to think through and develop expertise on that. I do know that that's where uh, a lot of the litigation seems to have gone that a couple of years ago when I started working on this courts were applying this higher necessity privilege threshold and actually entirely withholding the relevant evidence. But now I think more there's disclosure under protective orders and I know some companies um, uh, including Dr. Perlin's company have in, in some cases disclosed and, and others may have a whole 
um, policy of just automatically disclosing under protective orders. I think there's a lot of litigation about the scope of the protective orders, but I, I just don't have a lot to weigh in on that. Dr. Perlin? Uh, actually, I just want to comment. Uh, first, I don't think there's any actual dispute in science that the source code isn't relevant. Peer-reviewed papers uh, have shown that in uh, the sorts of cases uh, that the defense or even uh, could be prosecutors argue uh, that that source code was instrumental. It was always after the fact. So in the community, it's well known and published that source code review has, has not disclosed anything in a, in a commercial program like StarMix or Truil. It just, that's another urban myth. Um, it's, it's not useful. Um, could you repeat the question? It's, it's getting late here, sorry. Do you, do you think that well, it's a little difficult from a science perspective, but in terms of, is there a balance with a protective order? If a proper protective order is in place, do you have a problem disclosing the source code and which facets of the protective order seem to be sparking the most litigation as of right now? I think uh, in the cases that have been litigated and have ended up with something like the uh, Northern California model protective order, uh, we've said, okay, well, uh, our, in the hand, two or three cases like that, we've instructed the, the prosecutors uh, who, that's fine, we'll, we'll do that. And what's then proceeded to happen is one side or the other side just kept arguing. But in the Pickett case, the prosecutors kept arguing after we said it was fine. In other cases, the defense kept arguing. So from our perspective, if you lose the trade secret argument with a very real risk of theft in our field, which has happened and occurs with essentially no remedy, another company can take your technology, resell it as their own and put you out of business. Uh, that's a reality. That's a, one reason why you may not see much investment for new forensic technology in this area is if the source code issue continues to grow. It's never been the case that simply agreeing to a reasonable protective order has ended the dispute. The dispute continues, which is why a, a company that has other things to do, like to innovate, doesn't want to get involved uh, in innovating in a field where agreeing to a reasonable protective orders just drains all your time. You're still in court. People are still arguing. It doesn't end. I've never seen it end. Thank you. Uh, can I just jump in a, with a quick follow up? You know, the idea that compelled disclosure under a protective order in criminal cases to non business competitors of the kind that we hear are routine in criminal and ca civil cases would somehow deter investment uh, just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. We have a wealth of uh, companies that are routinely disclosing their trade secrets and civil litigation to business competitors under protective orders, and they're doing just fine. We have a company, StarMix, that has a policy of routinely disclosing under a protective order in the DNA forensic space, and it's doing just fine. Um, so a purely speculative argument about deterring investment uh, is not a reasonable uh, argument to deny relevant evidence when life and liberty are at stake. I think that's a great policy statement from my experience, what you're saying just isn't true. Um, it does def def um, deter innovation. Uh, things are stolen. The concern isn't lawyers stealing anything. It's if you have experts uh, who don't seem to be very expert in what they're even looking at. They usually don't know the programming language. They don't know the mathematics. They don't know how the systems work. They know how to bill for their time. Uh, you have people who are not really experts going around and looking at people's trade secrets. I don't know that that's the most trustworthy situation. I don't wanna debate with you. I was told this is not a debate. I do not wish to debate, but to say that concerns that are very real to people I know and to my company are not real concerns uh, try building software and marketing it in this field if you can't protect it. It's, it's a real concern, maybe not to people you know in academics, but to people who are out there uh, working 100 hours a week trying to get this technology out there 
for truth and justice, it's real. And a substantive trade secret law affords remedies. If in fact, an expert did steal the trade secrets, uh, you can sue. I understand. I've lost a patent suit. Uh, many million, a lot of money was spent on it. And uh, at the end of the day, the courts didn't provide any protection. So that's not what small innovative companies like to spend their time on. I mean, maybe it's good for IBM or Siemens. But again, I don't want to debate. I just want to answer your questions. It's just if, if you're saying what, what I'm saying isn't true, I can't not respond to it. I apologize. I would be interested to hear Charles's perspective from a civil world about the deterring investment idea and, and thoughts of concerns that companies have or, or don't have. You know, I think we need to remind ourselves that in the civil side, over the decades I've been doing this, we have developed a robust set of security procedures that are very detailed, that are negotiated in detail, and that are agreed upon the contract side. And under those circumstances, with robust security measures like encryption, the network computers, only being able to see the code in certain locations is wrong. I've never heard of any dispute arising about theft or taking under those types of security measures. Nor do I believe that companies fear that they will underinvest when they share source code and locations as companies all over the Silicon Valley routinely. But I really do think it's a question of robust security that builds trust so that the owners of software can be more secure. And so that's why I think the criminal side can really learn a lot from what we do. Another question that I would pose is taking a step back is there has been a debate of um, empirical testing is just as, if not more, I'm going to not take a stand on that, not my place, um, of a way to test the probabilistic genotyping software, or I guess to challenge it or to scrutinize it, is then one alternative fine, or should defense counsel, which is usually the case, not be limited to only empirical testing and get access to source code if they are equivalent or if, even if we were to go a step further and say the empirical testing is better. Dr. Perlin, your thoughts? Um, I don't think there's any relevance to source code review. I've, I review papers, I review methods, I have access to source code for other probabilistic genotyping software. Um, reading source code is a complete waste of time uh, for someone who actually develops software. It's, a, it's not anything that a scientist does in a laboratory. Nobody has access to it. The way we, the concept of empirical testing as one option is completely alien to a scientist. Empirical testing on data is the Daubert standard. It is the, been the scientific standard since Isaac Newton 350 years ago. Reading the source code when you describe it to scientists or software developers is, is, is laughable. Uh, there's no standard. There's no testing standard. There's no national standard. There's no Daubert standard. There's nothing that brings that in. Uh, but again, if a court orders it, you know, we comply. It just doesn't end there. I mean, I would be interested in Charles' uh, perspective on the notion that the defense requires a complete build environment needing to rebuild software on their own independently in order to establish reliability of software as opposed to testing it or something else. Is that, do you ever, have you seen that in a civil litigation setting where I, I think it depends on the type of case and the legal questions that we put in some trade secret cases, for example, pen testing from the outside is perfectly sufficient to deal with whether the question fits. In other cases, you do need, do need to do code comparison. For example, where someone is accused of taking code, studying authorial signatures buried within the code itself, code comments can be really important for establishing defenses or proving this appropriation. In some other cases, and I agree that they're rare, there are cases where uh, full decomposition. Decompilation and rebuild is really important to understanding how this all 
functions, uh, which may be cool, uh, which may go directly to the type of IP that plaintiff in a particular case is trying to claim. So I don't think we can come up with a cross the waterfront issue on the civil side. It's always an issue of question because the type of access really depends on the needs of the plaintiff and, the plaintiff and what's being claimed as IP and what they're trying to prove. But I've seen everything from non source code review to pen testing or even just looking at written use cases. But I have seen the other end of things, full rebuilds. I understand, but it seems like the questions that you're that you've seen in these hundreds of circumstances are different from the question of is the software reliable. The question in a criminal context is is this a reliable method that's been brought to bear on the evidence to you know to further give a statistical analysis. The question isn't has somebody copied it. It isn't has it been stolen. The question is is the software itself reliable. And in the examples you've been giving, uh, they, they, they certainly populate the civil sphere, but they don't seem to touch on the basic concept of reliability and the role of empirical testing, which is normative science and Daubert. I agree with you that reliability is only a subset, that in one slice of the pile of civil science, but there are civil trade secret cases where the reliability of the software is critically at stake. Um, in those cases, and I do want to emphasize with a lot of security procedures that everyone negotiates, in those types of cases, access is normal in that subset of cases. But I do want to emphasize that the balance of there's a lot of security to deal with the type of concerns that Dr. Cody you've been raising. Um, I think if I were a software owner, I would want to make sure that those types of security procedures were in place, whether it's a civil case or a um, I could I could add an example that I've uh, understood, and again, I think we have one scientist on this panel who has a particular perspective. What you're entitled to on the irrelevance of source code review, but other scientists do believe that source code review can be relevant to test reliability and other purposes. So one other example uh, is regulatory approval. So you say, say a regulatory agency approves a particular um, forensic software and a particular version of a forensic software. And then you have uh, employees in the forensics office that are tweaking that code in order to fix bugs, uh, redeploy it in a new operating system, whatever it is they wanna do. And some of those tweaks might rise to the level of changing the code so much as to require new regulatory approval. Others might not. That's a judgment call. Um, but those are the kinds of changes that you could potentially find in a source code review that would mean perhaps the uh, entity has used a software that really wasn't approved by the regulator. And, and so that's is an example where it could be helpful. Um, but going back to the question, uh, whether it's okay to tell the defense that uh, black box testing is what they should use to challenge the reliability threshold that's the government's burden to bear. Uh, and that the black box testing alternative should preclude them from accessing other relevant information. That's not how the law works unless you have a privilege. So uh, as I said in the beginning of my remarks, the reliability burden for admissibility is the prosecution's burden. And because we have an adversary system where different parties get to choose how they develop their own investigation and case, the prosecution can choose to satisfy its admissibility burden using black, text, black box testing only if it wants. That's its prerogative. But the defense is entitled to do an investigation and bring its case to prepare for cross-examination -examin using all relevant evidence. And you don't get, as the opposing party, to tell your adversary, hey, you know, there's another way you could have done this, or even there's a better way you could have done this. You don't get to direct the opposing party's case unless you have a privilege. And if you do have an evidentiary privilege, that's a special case where courts will say, hey, seeking party, you haven't met your necessity burden. You haven't shown necessity 
because there's this alternative mode of proof that you could use instead of seeking privileged information. But unless there is a privilege, each party gets and is entitled to access relevant evidence to prove its case however it wants, and the defense should be entitled to do that as well. I'm not going to debate. Uh, <laughs> obviously, I'm a scientist, and I believe in empirical testing, as have millions of other scientists over the last centuries. And I'm not a law professor. I don't know how to make clever arguments. I just know that crime labs don't see source code. Scientists don't see source code. We test, we publish, we validate, we follow standards. And uh, in my experience, even when we say, here's the source code, enjoy, it's just another year of litigation. It, does, it doesn't seem to be what anybody's interested in looking at. So different experiences, different backgrounds. Um, I have to actually uh, go somewhere now. Uh, we're like three minutes before the end. Uh, Kelly, do you have any other one question or so? Or uh, Let me ask you one question and then I'll let people wrap up, which is every piece, thank you, every piece of, or I should say not every, most pieces of technology today are built on source code. In the criminal context, from my own experience, we're not seeing a battle for source code on anything else. This, it's really been really in this universe. And I'm wondering if you have comments on why and should they be treated differently than other pieces of technology that are also built on source code? My own view before I go on that is that uh, Cybergenetics is a small company, of about 10 people. We're not a Thermo Fisher. You know, that's a $10 billion company. And I think it was a really easy attack on a small innovative company starting in 2009 to just start consuming our resources on these sorts of challenges. As you said, we haven't seen any place else. Uh, the software that we know doesn't work, like the FBI's CPI software, it's PopStat software, even it's CODIS software. We know it doesn't work. It doesn't preserve information. The match statistics are wrong. Almost nothing can be uploaded to CODIS and uh, as in terms of complex mixtures and evidence. And yet, I mean, the real openness that I would be fighting for if I was a law professor would be to open CODIS to better technologies. But we never saw those battles to the point where I asked uh, somebody writing a law review article about seven years ago, why are you writing a law review article about all the successful admissibility hearings of True Allele when you could be writing about the failure of mixture interpretation and the impact on 100,000 cases? And the answer was, because I wanna get my article published in law review. And this is interesting, that's old stuff. So I think what happened is that uh, cybergenetics was a useful target. We were small, this was a distraction. And all the software that's never really worked uh, for match statistics from larger companies and governments has never been attacked for its source code. Uh, so again, my journey has been different on this than if I had worked for the FBI and developed it. But I'm trying to answer your question, Kelly. I think it is unique. You could be asking, where's the source code for my robot, for my Hamilton robot? How do I know it's not contaminating my samples? Where's the DNA sequences for my STR kits? Uh, that was a, a brief thing 20 years ago. Uh, it doesn't happen. I think it's it's because of the, of, of the nature of the innovation happening at small companies. That's my sense. Thank you for okay. joining us, Dr. Berlin. I know that you're off to somewhere else. Um, yes. Thank you. And Professor Wexler, I will push that same question to you. Why, why have we seen this type of litigation where we haven't seen it in other technologies? So I'm gonna push back on that premise and say we have seen it uh, in a lot of other technologies. We've seen it in breath test devices. We've seen it in uh, forensic investigative software rather than DNA analysis. I think we're gonna to start to see it in, for instance, a cybercrime investigative software like um, software that's used to, exploit uh, to, used to get um, access to target computers on the internet using exploits. There's been a lot of source code discovery litigation around that. Uh, and I think we're gonna start to see it in other cases, but the breath test litigation, that's a really interesting one. That is another example where 
the New Jersey Supreme Court actually did compel breath test device source code to be disclosed to a bunch of court um, ordered intermediary experts and they discovered flaws in it that um, uh, led the New Jersey state to change its policies about um, wonder what circumstances those devices could be used and couldn't be used. Um, so there are examples where source code review has happened in criminal cases and has led to outcome determinative rulings um, in non-DNA forensic spaces. Um, the main true LL competitor, StarMix, has been disclosing this stuff for uh, routinely for, for a long time. And so I, I actually think the reason there's been so much litigation against uh, cyber genetics in this space is because cyber genetics has been coming up with a new theory that their trade secrets should be privileged and given special protections that um, it didn't need to make that argument. It could just have been disclosing under a protective order all the time without spending all that money. And by the way, spending money that the public defense council doesn't really have to litigate with either. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wexler. And thank you to all of our panelists for joining today. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much.